good to have everybody with us. Enjoy that good music. Amen. Amen. That's better than anything I've heard all week long out there in the world. Amen. Amen. Uh, I want you to uh, turn with me this morning now. We're going to get back into this uh, thing about CERN, but uh, we're going to come at it from a different perspective, and that's always good because when you do that, it gives you depth, and uh, you don't want to be the kind of uh, a person who studies and you've only got one source and you quote him or her uh, continually. There needs to be more. And so uh, today we're going to look at it from a different perspective, but we're going to be talking about the same thing. Uh, over here in the book of uh, 1 Timothy, in uh, chapter number 4 and verse 1, 1 Timothy 4, 1. Uh, the apostle says that the spirit speaketh expressly. And that is a uh, unique term. Notice carefully. The spirit speaketh expressly. That in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now keep in mind that what you're looking at in 1 Timothy 4 is apostasy. And apostasy... Uh, is a horrible, horrible sin. What does it mean? Apostasy means to one time be in the faith or at least profess a belief in the faith and uh, fall away from it and remove yourself from it. That's apostasy. And you understand that, that there are millions and millions and millions on this earth who've never even heard the name of Christ, you see, and they're not accountable as apostates. It's this country that uh, makes up America and Europe. Uh, many of the churches in Europe, they've closed down, reopened as bingo parlors and whatever, and they're no longer preaching the word of God. Uh, it's apostasy. And when apostasy sets in, it doesn't stop. It's like a cancer. It doesn't stop until it has consumed everything in its path that uh, relates to it. So we are in a spiritual apostasy in this country right now. As I've told you before, there's a thing called the emerging church movement, which is a broad, uh, a broad definition. Uh, it's like a cafeteria. You go through the cafeteria line. You have all kinds of things that you can pick out. And uh, when you get to the end of the line, whatever you've picked out, that's your, your choice. Well, that's the way the emerging church is today. They have no standard. They have no Bible. They use the Bible, but they don't believe it. And no authority. Uh, but they are, uh, they are a law unto themselves. And so when, when an individual is a law unto himself, he's what's called lawless. And uh, this is one of the designations of the Antichrist. He's the lawless one. Uh, so they're a law unto themselves. They have no authority. And uh, therefore they operate under a con 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 completely different uh, set of rules and guidelines as you do as Christians. And so the word semantics comes in play, and the word semantics simply means that I say red, you say red, red for you and red for me are two different things. It's the spin that I put on it. That's what semantics has to do with it. And you live in that time, and that characterizes deception. Now here's what's important about this message this morning. I'm going to show you the link between the New Age movement, the emerging church, and science. Remember, science is CERN, Switzerland. And as I told you, I quoted Bertolucci, who said that we will open a portal into another dimension or another world, another existence. And what comes through that portal, we do not know, or we may send something through that portal. So what is it? It's the unknown. It's the factor of the unknown. So this is the age that you live in today. Since men rejected absolute truth, and they did reject absolute truth, what is absolute truth? Absolute truth means that red is red, and you judge your red by the real red. That's the bottom line. The absolute truth says that the Bible is the word of God, and everything else is judged by the absolute truth of the scripture, the revelation in the Bible. Amen. That's absolute truth, not relative truth. Relative truth is what is preached today from the pulpits. Relativism is an insidious cancer that eats away at truth and revelation. And we live in a relativistic age. If it feels good, if that's your truth, so forth and so on, then you do it. So we have these three elements today, 
that are dovetailing to bring the world into its spiritual state. Everybody is spiritual. You have never known in your lifetime as many people today, and so many of them profess to be atheist agnostics, but they're all spiritual. Don't you think that's quite remarkable? We live in a spiritual, we live in a time of spiritual deception. And everybody is in control of their own destiny. You hear that a lot. They're in control of their own spiritual identity. You hear that a lot. They're in control of their own spiritual world. They are in control. Remember, that's the key. They're, they're not going to listen to some man up in the pulpit who opens the Bible and begins to preach the scripture and say, thus saith the Lord. They'll reject that outright. Say, you're not going to tell me how to live. You're not going to tell me what to believe. You're not going to tell me anything. If I lack some of what you said, fine. Otherwise, it's out the door. Yep. So therefore, they threw out the pulpit and threw out the Bible and brought the stool in. The purpose of the stool is to not look intimidating. The purpose of the stool is to become informal. I mean, who sits on a stool with a tuxedo on, you know? <laughs> the idea of the stool, therefore, is so that they can interact with you and then, therefore, put you in the position of authority and not them. And so this is where we are today. This is how it has all emerged and, uh, and uh, come to the point it's at. So the New Age movement, why do they call it New Age? There's a reason for that. Now, how many have never heard of the New Age movement? All right, good. I'm glad all, if you haven't, that's okay. We'll t we're going to talk about it. Uh, folks, we're not in here to, uh, to browbeat and beat people down because they don't know something. Everybody's ignorant. You need to get, to get a hold of that. I don't care if you've, got a, if, if you've got an IQ of 220. Everybody's ignorant of certain things. Nobody knows everything. But, every, you know, you can help ignorance, but you can't do a thing about stupid. <laughs> 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 so we hope, we hope all we have to deal with here is, in, in here is ignorance. <laughs> but anyway, what's the New Age movement? The New Age movement uh, gets, its, uh, it gets its name from the idea that we're passing from an older age into a newer age, specifically the age of Aquarius. These ages are related to the signs of the zodiac in what's called the precession of the equinoxes. There's a phenomena that, that is observable, and the, and the Maya observed it. It's been observed down through the ages, that if you look up at the sky and watch the movement of the stars, you know, the apparent movement of the stars, we're moving, but it, it looks like they're moving, that over an extended period of time, let's say, for example, Polaris, the North Star, uh, 10,000 years ago might not have been the North Star because it's gradually shifting. Now, that's, that's some, that's some uh, high-tech stuff. But the point is that from one constellation into another, you see this movement in the heavens, and this is what's called the movement of ages. This is why they said back in the 70s, I think it was the 70s or the 60s, in a musical called Hair, a group called The Fifth Dimension, the fifth dimension, they chose that name, uh, came out with a, with a song, The Age of Aquarius. Aquarius is the water carrier. Certain characteristics characterize every age. This new age, this age of Aquarius that is dawning, notice the terminology back then, the dawning of the age of Aquarius. In other words, as the sun just comes up, you have the dawning of the day, it's just beginning. So the age of Aquarius was an age characterized mostly by enlightenment, that people now are smarter than they were before. And that uh, the reason for that is because men are evolving spiritually. Now that's a big buzzword. They are evolving spiritually. So out with the old antiquated idea of sin and redemption and salvation and the cross and all of that, and in with the new idea of self-actualization, self-realization, self-illumination. Notice the self, selfies, self, self, self. You ever known a generation that's more consumed with self? I passed a woman on the interstate yesterday, and she was up here in the, in the window. She was driving a car now. She's headed up the road. And, and I saw her, and she's working on her eyes like that. And, 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 this, and I thought, how in the world? That's an accident looking for a place to happen right there. But anyway, 
Uh, you know, if I, this face, the only face I've got, I can't do much with it. <laughs> it's with me when I go to bed and when I get up. So I just got used to it. <laughs> and that's the best thing to do. Uh, but in any event, but everything is about self today. So in any event, the enlightenment, this idea of being enlightened, this idea of spiritual evolution. Now you understand with Darwinism, Darwinism has far more than just biological evolution. His, his thesis was about biological evolution, which I reject, but he also, from that, the springboard came of, of, uh, of spiritual evolution, social evolution, and all this other stuff that goes with it. So men today have evolved spiritually, and they are ready for the age of Aquarius, the age of the water bearer, and the age of enlightenment. So that builds up the pride and pumps up the ego. I mean, I'm an enlightened one. I'm an initiate. I know more than my grandfather knew. I'm definitely uh, more into spiritual things than my great-grandfather. They wasted all their time out here praying and going to revival meetings and brush arbor meetings and getting saved. I don't need that anymore. I'm, I'm a super spiritual enlightened uh, soul. That's the idea, see. That's, that's, that's the mindset. So these, these emerging churches feed that. They never say anything about hell. You hear nothing about judgment. There's nothing about sin There's, because these are antiquated. These are outdated. This stuff is not necessary today. We know better than that. That's what these guys are giving you from the pulpit, not the pulpit, from the stool. Uh, they'll probably get rid of the stool. That all evolved. I don't know what's next, maybe a recliner. <laughs> I mean, that might, that might work good too, you know, just come in, kick back, kick your shoes off, and, you know, and have your service. I mean, it's coming to that point, believe me. I mean, everything has to be comfortable and no claims on you, you know, nothing. But in any event, the age of Aquarius is a new age, therefore it has a power attached to it, it is a spirit attached to it. Now, they had a thing called harmonic convergence that they took out there in the West a, a few decades ago where a bunch of New Agers got together, and the idea was that if they can have this consciousness and, 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 and they can bring it together and they can concentrate it, that they can bring about to spiritual transformations and the power that they want. And uh, they all got together out there, and I think it was Sedona, Arizona. And Sedona, Arizona is one of the hot spots in this country, along with a lot of other, but this is especially a hot spot in this country for New Age movement and New Age ideas. And here's something else about that, while I'm talking about it, and this is important, this is very, 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 very important, that anywhere you find all of this New Age, this, this super spiritual, this enlightenment, it's an amazing thing how that UFOs, paranormal activity, uh, is associated with it. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. Uh, birds of the same feather, birds of a feather, do what? That's right. That's exactly right. So that's what's going on with the New Age movement. Now, here's why it's so important, though. For so long, the scientific community has completely rejected religion as outdated, a bunch of foolishness, just ignorant, stupor, superstitious, redneck, uh, you know, the fellow that's up there in the White House, God, guns, and uh, what was it he said? Uh, the Bible and whatever, you know, that was a, that was a if, if you, here's, well, here's how to read that. That was contempt. And more than once he has made reference to the scripture in a contemptuous manner. Yes, they can spin it any way they please. Of course, he came from Harvard, you know, and, and, uh, uh, ostensibly he did, and uh, other, you know, all this of his background, the idea is he's, a, he's an illustration of the elitist attitude, the elite. But now this is what's happening. This is important, very important. When Bertolucci says that we're going to open a door and we don't know what's coming through that, or we may send something through that door, he is admitting that there is an existence that they may not be able to explain that something may be going on that just doesn't fit under a microscope or on a, on, a, on a pad or in a lecture. In other words, a spiritual world, that's the key to understanding it, a spiritual world. With that spiritual world, therefore, science has been sucked right in to the deceit of Satan. For Satan, folks, is... Um, 
far as I know, I can't, uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't prove this, uh, second only to God in power, uh, that is, if he's stronger than Michael. And uh, Satan's quite a, quite a creature. And not only that in power, in physical power, but also in intelligence. Satan is one smart cookie. So the New Age movement is the age of Aquarius, the age of enlightenment, and are we being enlightened? I was talking to my brother a moment ago about quantum computers. And uh, quantum computers, how many's ever heard of a quantum computer? Well, I hadn't until just a few days ago. Here's the problem, folks. There's so much stuff out there, and it's happening so quickly, it's almost impossible to keep up with it. Amen. It really is. It's almost impossible. A quantum computer makes a supercomputer that they, that they spend millions of dollars for today look like a snail in comparison in processing speed and, and uh, ability. They have, to, they have to reduce the, the, the computer itself into a sub-zero temperature, I forget what it was, but it's way down there in order for it to operate in that environment. But here's the, here's the thing, it is capable of so much more computing power. And they use the illustration of an F-35, I think, uh, Air Force, one of the fighter jets that they have recently uh, came out with, the F-35. I might be wrong on that, I believe it's F-35. And literally, it takes a computer to fly that thing. It, it is so it is it is it is so high tech that it, that it's that it's it's it doesn't it doesn't have the aerodynamic ability to fly like a normal plane. It has to be computer controlled so that every movement of air across its wings and the drag and all of that stuff is computer controlled. And so uh, they say that uh, that that uh, I forget how many lines, millions of lines of code is necessary to fly that airplane. But with something like this new, this quantum computer, uh, it can fly many of those airplanes at one time because of its, its vast ability to process all this information and process it quickly. What's that mean? That means that the door opening into high technology, which opens into a new world, is opening. That's what's happening. And men are treading where angels fear to tread. They're crossing a line going into a realm that they are unprepared for. And that's why Stephen Hawking said he is worried to death that they're about to destroy the universe as we know it. So there we are. This is all happening. It's happening right now while we're sitting here uh, this morning in this building. Now, the New Age movement is a cult, occultic, occult. The word occult means hidden. It means that which is is hidden. Compare that to apocalyptic, apocalypsis, occult, apocalyptic, all right? These are diametrically opposed. Occult means to be hidden. Apocalyptic means to be revealed. That's the difference. They are diametrically opposed. One hides, the other reveals. The occult world is a world of initiations, spirit beings, uh, enlightenment, it's a world of power. The, Satan said to the Lord, all this I have I can give to whomsoever I will if you'll just bow down. All of this stuff is going on right now, but here's the thing. Keep this in mind. Either the power of the Holy Spirit of God is energizing you or it is the power of hell that's energizing you. Now here's what to remember. It doesn't make any difference whether you are a a, a Hindu guru, a New Age shaman, a scientist working at CERN, Switzerland, and looking into a, another dimension, or whatever, either you are connected with the Holy Spirit or you are connected with the spirit of hell. One or the other. Right. Making a difference. You can call yourself a New Age guru, but the fact of the matter is the same spirit that indwells you indwells a witch or a Satanist or a serial killer or a cannibal or whatever. And you say, well, now that's rough, but that's the fact. He said, you're either for me or against me. You either have the Holy Spirit or you have an unholy spirit. The unholy spirit can masquerade itself in a lot of different ways. But its root and origin is the same. 
Therefore, you share the same identity. In John 8, 44, he said, you are of your father, the devil. And these were the most religious people on earth, but they were of their father, the devil. The occult world is very, very smart. Listen to this little synopsis from a fellow by the name of Rye. Pi, I think his name's, I forget, I can look it up for you. Anyway, the founder of Scientology, <coughs> L. Ron Hubbard, was a practicing Satanist and tried to raise powerful demons through a series of ceremonial ma magical rites that he conducted with the famous Satanist, Jack Parsons. Parsons himself studied magic under the most notorious black magician of the 20th century, Aleister Crowley. During a magical rite, notorious, uh, during a magical rite, Crowley became possessed by the demon of Horus while on a trip to Egypt in 1904. This demon called itself I was, A-I-W-A-Z. Over a period of several years, the demon strengthens its grip strengthened its grip until it had Crowley under its complete control. I'd put that away in the back of my mind and I'd take that home right now and meditate over that one statement. Over a period of years, this demon gradually took this man until it completely possessed him and had complete control over him. Uh, working through Crowley via the occult technique known as channeling, which is big in the New Age movement, the demon produced a number of major works on black magic, including the Book of the Law and the Book of Lies. These satanic books have been consulted avidly ever since by students of the occult, most of them, most of whom try to raise demons through the rites of ceremonial magic. Now let's stop and park for just a moment. What does it take to raise a demon? See, what does it take? If you want to conjure up a demon to do something for you, uh, what would it take to do that? Well, how accessible are they? What do you need to know? What do you need to do? What do you need to become in order to conjure up a demon? How do you do that? Well, first of all, as a Christian, I don't care about anything to do with demons. All right? But here's the thing about a demon. A demon is an intelligent Spirit being. You got to put that away in your mind. Remember, they said, We know who thou art, the Holy One of God. They knew who he was. All right. A demon is a, an intelligent spirit being. They're vain. When you talk about them, they come around. They're waiting for you to open a door. To allow them to come into your life. They may come in innocently enough. It may be an enjoyable experience at the beginning. It may be something you've sought for all your life. For example, enlightenment, <coughs> riches, power. You may find that you're able to control people. You may experience things that you never imagined possible. But when that demon comes in, remember what he said. It took it years to take complete control of Crowley. What's that mean? That means in incremental steps, the man yielded his own sovereignty over to a spirit being. And by doing that, the spirit being took complete possession of him. Just the other day, a sodomite killed his lover in Canada and ate him. He was 24, 26 years old. Now, I bet you didn't hear that on CBS, NBC, and ABC. But it's, it's you know, you, the news media, you can, you can get the material. And uh, no question about it, it happened. Uh, I was reading on a website yesterday. Now the end begins, I think it was, or whatever. But you can't believe everything you read on websites. But get a reputable news source, see, and corroborate it from another source. And he was 26 years old, killed his lover, and ate him. What's that? That's demonism. That's demonism. To deny the authority of the word of God is what? A doctrine of a what? Devil. Devil. It's called a seducing spirit. Remember, 
Everything has a spirit attached to it, either the Holy Ghost or an unholy ghost. So in any event, what I'm giving you here now is I'm trying to lay the foundation for the, for the, uh, for the foundational aspect of why we are dealing with what's called the New Age movement in this country. It started, and here is one perspective on it, and it moved, and it has been brought to us today. Aleister Crowley was definitely a wicked man. He was an Englishman. Uh, Helen Blavatsky is the one who was the guru of the Theosophist movement. Theosophist means wisdom of God. She was a, and when they say God, we'll get into this later, they don't mean God like you mean God. But she, uh, was, the, uh, she was the moving force in theosophy. She wrote a very famous book as far as the occult world is concerned, Isis Unveiled. That book gets you into the occult world and to the occult mind and all that goes along with it. But here's the point. She had a disciple whose name was Annie Besant. Annie Besant was an American. Uh, 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 Lavatsky was a Russian. So one produces a disciple that produces another disciple that produces another disciple, and Blavatsky's produ uh, uh, published a, uh, a, 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 a newspaper that was called the Lucifer. It was called Lucifer. Now, who's Lucifer? Well, I have to change the name of that to Lucis after it came under scrutiny. These people especially Blavatsky, especially Blavatsky. These people laid the foundational work for what we know today as the New Age movement and as the occult world. They refer back to her writings and they refer back to her as a great authority. Now, she was not original with anything. She, can, she goes back into the past and builds this stuff, but most people are lazy. They like to find a source and appeal to that source without doing the research themselves. And so this is why that Blavatsky is a uh, prime source when it comes to the occult New Age movement. Now, here are some of the New Age lies. In the book of Genesis, chapter number 3, Satan said, Ye shall be as gods. He promised them that they would be as gods. A New Age lie is therefore that man can become God. Now you need to understand something with that because it will help you greatly. A New Ager does not believe that God is a personal being. God is a, is a saturated spiritual uh, interconnectedness that permeates the universe. And that when you tap into that, you've tapped into Godhood through enlightenment. Now remember, would there be any problem for a physicist at CERN, Switzerland, through his, through his, uh, through his uh, scientific analysis, to have a problem believing that, well, maybe we're going to tap into extraterrestrials. Maybe we're going to meet up with something's going to come through this door here that, that is some kind of an advanced spiritual being. And so therefore, you know, we're going to learn something by communicating with this thing somehow or another, bottom line, that the scientist at CERN, Switzerland, absolutely refuses to believe in a personal God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jehovah of the Old Testament, Christ of the New. But they will believe in some kind of a spirit force. You remember Star Wars? You remember one of the things was the what be with you, the force. The force is an impersonal spiritual power. The New Age movement calls the force the Holy Spirit. That's semantics again. That's where you spin it and make it apply the way you want it to. The Holy Spirit is not the force. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Blessed Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. And that is of a personal being. A personal being that is from everlasting to everlasting that is the creator of the universe that speaks and brings universes into existence. This is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that manifested himself as a man 2,000 years ago that has a mind of his own that we have to give an account to as sinners, not some impersonal thing 
where people just tap into this consciousness and become enlightened spiritual beings. See, once it's impersonal, there's no personal accountability. Once you make it personal, there's a personal accountability. Once you say that there is a God that's seated in the third heavens and that at his right hand is the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Bible says, who shall give an account to the, at, at, all of us appear before the judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne judgment, we are accountable creatures before a personal God. Every one of us. Every one, every last one of us. That includes the devil. Because we're all creatures. Satan's a creature. The only one that is not a creature is the creator. And there's only one creator. Now that's the Jehovah of the Old Testament. But here's the thing. They spin this thing to make it look so appealing to people today because if you brainwash a young person from the time that they come into this world old enough to understand anything and brainwash them and make them think that they are the center of the universe, that everything revolves around them, that they're the most important thing that walks on the face of the earth, and that their least desire should become a reality, that they live under an, 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 uh, a spirit of entitlement. Have you ever noticed how unthankful that the generation is today? Well, the reason they're unthankful is because they have the spirit of entitlement. Well, that's mine anyway. You're not really giving me anything. It's that idea. When we grew up, we grew up under the, under the idea, well, I had a little lawnmower I pushed up and down Beaumont Avenue and off the other side. I had my own clients. I had my lawnmower business long before these guys holding these, carrying these big things around behind them. That's all fine, but I didn't have one of them. I just had my lawnmower and a, ca and a gas can. <laughs> and, and I went around, I bowed yards. Why'd they do that? I didn't have any money. I learned real fast how to fight poverty, get a job. <laughs> it worked good. <laughs> That paycheck coming in was, was a big help. <laughs> My grandfather didn't have any money. We lived, uh, we lived from hand to mouth. And so if I wanted any money, I went out and earned it. Then I went to work at a, at, a, at a car wash over here on Broadway. Went over there to the guy, and he said, you know what a chamois is? I looked at the guy with, with two of us replying at the same time. <laughs> I didn't have an idea what a chamois was. You know what a chamois is? I found out what one was because I learned how to use it. But he hired us anyway. I was honest with him. I said, I don't have a clue. <laughs> but I want a job. So I got a job working at a car wash. And I'll tell you, I don't want to chase the rabbit here, but I'll tell you this. This will be good. Everything you do in life, try everything. <laughs> I mean, you'll be surprised at how if you try it, you learn from it, and you may find out what you're here in this world for. I mean, I've tried a lot of different things. And I wound up, God called me to preach and get up here and preach his word and pastor the church when he saved my soul. And I left a good job as a professional mechanic. And I could still be a professional mechanic. But I'm thank God today at 68, I don't have to be a mechanic. <laughs> It'd be a lot harder on these bones. Uh, God called me to preach and save me. So I tell, I tell young people, I try it. As long as it's legal. <laughs> try it. Flip hamburgers. Work at McDonald's. Try it. Wash cars, mow yards, try it, and it'll help you as you develop and grow in this world. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. All right. Where was I? Good night. I'm going to plumb off the thing here. <laughs> Impersonal God. That's it. All right. Impersonal God. How much time we got? Left? We got about 10 minutes. I'll go another five minutes. We'll take some questions if you, if you have any. Here's the next thing. Everything is evolving. Everything is evolving, including the soul. This is why the idea of karma, how many know what karma is? All right. You know where karma came from? Karma came from Gautama Buddha. And Gautama Buddha got it from the Brahmist. And the Brahmist and the Hindu and the Buddha are all, are all bed buddies. Brahmism, Hinduism, Buddhism, they all have a common source. Brahmism is the oldest. And the common source is Eastern mysticism. The common source is the rejection of the Word of God. And the, and if the Bible, the Word of God was carried into India. It was carried into India, and, but it was rejected. And so uh, the, to this day, they sit in ignorance and in and, uh, and darkness. But the idea of karma is that, well, you know, we just can't figure out why some people have such a hard life and others seem to be doing so much better. So they sat down and they figured out, well, you know, it must be that they've had a previous life and they're paying for their sins. And so therefore, let, they're going to pay for their sins. And so who am I to come along and and, uh, and, and, you know, and to, and to elevate them to a higher. So what you get is a caste system. 
And, and India is, hot, is still there, folks, by the way, a caste system. Uh, not just India. You ought to read a little bit about Mexico. You'd be surprised at what a caste system Mexico had. Benito Juarez, who was the president of Mexico, they just had Cinco de Mayo. You remember Cinco de Mayo, 5th of May? They just had that. That was about the first Battle of Pueblo. And that Battle of Pueblo was because they had a European come into Mexico to extend, and it was, he was a proxy of France, to extend their empire. He came into Mexico, and he was overthrown. Benito Juarez was an Indian, either an Aztec, Mayan, mixture of all. And he became the duly elected president of Mexico, Benito Juarez. And from all indications I've read, he loved his people, loved his country, and all of that. But he was an Indian. He was not of the pure Spanish blood. The pure Spanish blood was what was elevated above everything in Mexico. That's a caste system. It's still there. It's still there. It's still in Europe. It's still over there in India. A caste system, therefore, puts people in classifications higher up the ladder. We've got a caste system in this country. Don't you know that? I'm a peon. I don't know about you, but I'm a peon. I'm a, I'm a peon. Like at West Point, I'm a plebe. <laughs> but what is it? Well, we have the elite. And they feel like that they know so much more than you do. That it doesn't make any difference if you go to the polls and vote and who you vote for in the democratic republic that we live in, all that. Forget that. They are going to dictate to you what they want your life to be like and what they think this, the world should be like. And a world government is being formulated uh, at this very moment, right now, while you're sitting in this building. How many's ever heard of Cecil Rhodes? How many's ever heard of Rhodesia? All right, you've heard of Rhodesia. Cecil Rhodes was a, was a wealthy Englishman who made his wealth through diamonds and other things, and he wanted a one world government. And so he established a, what you might call today, they have, uh, how many's ever heard of a Rhodes Scholarship? How many's ever heard, how many know that Bill Clinton was a Rhodes Scholar? And so does uh, Larry Theophanopoulos, uh, not Theophanopoulos, what's that guy's name? Uh, Stephanopoulos. Stephanopoulos is a Rhodes Scholar. Do you know what Rhodes Scholar means? It means that it's, he, belong, he received a scholarship from an organization that is based solely on the fact they're going to have a one world government. And through Great Britain, since Cecil Rhodes was a British man, British they're going to do it through Great Britain. They're going to rule over the world and have a one world government. Now that gets on into America and the Council on Foreign Relations and all of this other stuff. We don't have time for all that this morning. I just want to put that out there to you. These are the elite of the elite who tell you how to live your life. They know better than you do. You're an ignorant peon down here in the lower rung. That's a caste system. Aren't you glad when the sun makes you free, you're free indeed? Aren't you glad when he says in the book of John, chapter number one, which were born not of blood? Amen. What's that mean? That means, do you know where the term blue blood came from? How many ever heard the term blue blood? Blue blood came from the European monarchs that never got out in the sun, that stayed inside their castles, their mansions, and never got a suntan, and didn't work and have hard hands, and because their skin was so white, you could literally see the veins. And if you look at the veins in your arm right now, what color is that? When you bleed, what color is it? But in the, when you look at it in there, it's blue. That's where the term blue blood came from. In other words, a blue, it, it falls into the language later. It means that if somebody's called a blue blood, it means, well, he is, you know, he's some of the elite pedigree. And on it goes, uh, the blue bloods. I'll stop there. And if you have any questions, we'll pick them up and pick this up again next week. We stopped at the elite. We'll pick it up next week. Anybody have a question? Yes, sir. I got a comment. Good.
That's true. That's true. It used to be French. Now it's English. The, uh, uh, the thing over there where it said, nothing that they attempt to do will be restrained from them, I think that's a, that's a, that's a very telling statement about man made in the image of God. In the book of Hebrews, it said he was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. All right? But the thing is, man is a much more complicated, advanced being than people give credit to. Yes, sir. Yeah, I wondered about him. Yeah. Has he defined the wormhole yet? Okay. 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 Well, they always are. Okay. Now, let me give you this. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll come to you right here in a second, brother. Chris Putnam the other day gave a good illustration of what he thought a wormhole represented. All right. I'm going to go from point A to point B. Okay. I'm going to go to point A to point B. All right. I've got an apple. I've got an apple. That worm will go right through that apple, won't it? It goes through the apple. That's where you get your wormhole. Now, if I'm going to go from point A to point B, but I get into this world of theoretical physics, you take it and you fold it together. And instead of going from point A to point B, the length of it, you go from point A to point B through a dimension. That's how he explained the wormhole. Y'all are following me now. If you can open up a hole in a dimension, you don't have to travel a thousand light years to get from one place to the next place. If you can open up a hole in that dimension, you can move like this. Instead of going from here to here, linear in the linear movement, the dip, say this is 500 light years from here to here. It takes you so long to go 500 light years. It takes you 500 years traveling speed of light. But you want to get from here to here but you don't have 500 years to get there. See what's happened? In order to do this, you've got to move from one dimension to the other. In other words, you've got to open up a wormhole, a black hole, the ability to travel from here to here. And how far is it now? That's what they're, that's what they're doing, the vast distances in the universe. Yes, sir. Oh, he did say that about homosexuality? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, the Supreme Court right now. Our Supreme Court. Those, uh, what is it, nine justices? Those Supreme Court justices right now are, are deliberating on whether to, to make a judgment on what constitutes a marriage in this country. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. What comes to Vegas is left in Vegas. Right. Okay. Okay. Sure. That's called hedonism. Yeah. Well, they're more in your face with this stuff now. See, they're blatant with it. They're in your face with it, and uh, it just—it's mind-boggling, because apparently the another door, another another part of the wall has been moved back and allowed more of it to come out. Yes, sir. Yeah, Tomorrowland. Yes, it does. I saw a video on that thing, and that was one of the trailers that they put in there. It was the Tomorrowland with Clooney, 
And the idea, though, I think in Tomorrowland is that it's dimensional. In other words, it's not, it's not linear, going from one end of the paper to the other. It's going through a wormhole. It's going through a dimension, a black hole. Some, and this is what they're trying to do, folks. They're trying to open up a hole. That's what CERN is about. This is colliding. They're opening up a hole so that they can go. F this is why he said something may come through that hole or we may send something through that hole. Yes, sir. I have seen it, but it's been a while. I was on it last night, and they had that article about CERN yeah. on there, and down at the bottom if you read it, it says, to learn more, click here, and I clicked on it, it went to uh, <laughs> you, and it starts preaching the message. So somebody posted that on there when I got to read it. Okay. Well, they do that. They take these messages. I've never posted anything, but they take them, and they post them, and then they repost them and stuff like that. The only thing that has ever been posted from here that I have anything to do with is what these sisters do back here when they upload it to the Lion of Judah. If you see anything on YouTube or anything else like that, I did not put that on there. So, you know, I, I hope, the reason I say that, that's a disclaimer, the reason I say it, I hope these are a bunch of good people. Right. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, the idea is guilt by association, you know. If they put me with a bunch of bank robbers, oh, Lofton's a bank robber, huh? <laughs> okay, you know. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Now there's some good stuff out there. Some of these guys apparently are good people and they've put some effort into it, put it together. You know, I'm not, I'm not uh, black mouthing them, but, but the point is that I didn't do that. I didn't do it, but it looks like a lot of it's been thought out and well done. Right. Right. Uh, you, have a, you have a right under the laws of uh, copyright to use excerpts in certain portions whatever you want to, you know, anybody can do that. And that's all fine. But I just want you to understand, I didn't do it. And uh, if, you see, if you see a bunch of atheists on there and they put me on there, I didn't do that. <laughs> all right, let's have a word of prayer and we'll let you go. I know we've run over a little bit. I'm glad you're interested. I am. Brother Ronnie Crane.